Previously, we learned what whole exome sequencing is. Now, we will introduce the bioinformatics pipeline. Specifically, we will talk about how our team of scientists read the DNA sequences to discover what genetic mutations may be the cause of your child's symptoms. After sequencing your DNA, a file of data is produced that can be as large as the size of a 16 gigabyte iPhone. How do these large files of sequenced DNA from TGen's laboratory bench reach the clinic bedside in finding a diagnosis for our patients? The first step in analyzing the patient sequence exome is to identify the variants or changes. We do this by comparing your DNA sequences to the reference sequence or the original human genome that was sequenced by the Human Genome Project. It is similar to assembling a puzzle of DNA fragments by looking at the completed puzzle picture. On average, there are about 15,000 variants or changes in the DNA sequence of the exome in any person we sequence. Variants in the DNA sequence can arise in many different ways. One way is through a single nucleotide or base pair change. This is where one base is substituted for another. Another way is through an insertion of random bases that were not present in the original sequence. Sometimes, variations can even arise through deletions. In this case, bases from the original sequence are randomly removed. These variants make our DNA unique to us, but not all variants are indicative of disease. Let's use a common word, for example. Say you have the word old. At some point, another base, G, was added to the sequence, making it read gold. Since this still makes sense, the variation is harmless and the person would be unaffected. But if the D was removed, the new sequence reads goal, which has no meaning, therefore would negatively affect the protein and gives disease. Sometimes it is difficult to identify the cause of a disease because the deletion or insertion was so large, sequencing could not identify it. Instead, a chromosomal microarray can unveil some of these large variations. With over 20,000 protein encoding genes, how can a variant in one gene be pinpointed as the cause of a disease? This analysis process is part human and part computer. And I, along with a team of other scientists, filter through the list of genetic variants and compare the patient's genotype to that of their parents' genotypes. And this allows us to determine if the variant is de novo, recessive, dominant, X-linked, or mitochondrial. We then use several different tools that help us to predict how damaging or pathogenic the variant is, and also use publicly available databases to determine the frequency of the variant in the general population. Lastly, we check published journal articles to see if the gene that the variant is in has been previously associated with disease. There are some limitations to whole exome sequencing and our knowledge of gene function. At the C4RCD, we have an amazing diagnosis rate of 30 to 40 percent. However, this means that some families still go undiagnosed. So one of the reasons is that we do not know the role of all the genes in a cell. We may find a variant in a gene, but because we don't know its function, we cannot connect that variant to the disease. Another reason would be that there are limitations to the technology. Exome sequencing is not very well at capturing uh, repetitive regions or small deletions. A third reason would be is that mutations are not always present in the exome, but they could also be in a region often referred to as junk DNA, although it could still be associated with disease. And last, we don't give up. We're trying new technologies to increase our diagnostic rate at all times. As research progresses and technology is advanced, we are hoping that genomic medicine can be improved and more diagnoses can be made for many unsolved patient cases with continuous reanalysis. Thank you for watching part two of this video series. If you have any questions, 
please ask one of the members of the C4RCD staff.